Welcome to today's conversation and thank you all for being here. My name is Malachi Hammonds and I'm a member of the Lumbee Tribe of North Carolina and I'm the co-leader of Native Americans of Verizon, one of the many employee resource groups we have here at Verizon. During the day, I'm an analyst on Verizon's enterprise sales operations team. Before we jump into today's event, I wanted to take a moment and acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from Baltimore, Maryland, the traditional homelands of the Pastataway people. And I want to show respect and honor to the original caretakers of this land and the keepers of the Pastataway culture. We encourage everyone joining us to take the time to learn the original people and cultures of your lands, as well as find ways to show respect and acknowledge indigenous traditions and cultures and contributions and cultures. Today, NAV and our colleagues at Verizon's state government affairs team are pleased to be able to bring an incredible, important conversation around missing and murdered indigenous women and girls to this platform. This issue is often referred to as a silent crisis, and our goal today is to amplify the voices and efforts of the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center, who have been working for years to break the silence. We encourage all who are watching to listen learn and seek ways to be true allies in this effort. As attendees, you have the option to engage in this live event through the event chat on your left-hand side. And if you have any questions that come to, you, come to you, please feel free to submit them through the Q&A feature also located on the left-hand side. This event is also being recorded and will be later posted on US Tech Future, a Verizon-led community-focused initiative working to engage the local community and discussions around technology and how it can improve the lives of local residents for their benefit and the benefit of the community as a whole. Our moderator for today's conversation is Kuule Jekasat. Kuule is Verizon's Director of Local Government and Community Affairs for Utah and Nevada and Tribal Nations. She's also a member uh, and a board member of NAV, Native Americans of Verizon. Thank you, Kuole, for agreeing to facilitate this conversation, and I'm happy to turn the mic over to you. Thank you so much, Malachi, and thank you to our Native Americans of Verizon ERG and our Verizon State Government Affairs team for your efforts in putting this event together. Today's topic is not an easy one to discuss or to hear, but it needs a voice. Statistics show that those who identify as American Indians and Alaska Natives are two times more likely to experience rape or sexual assault than any other ethnic group in the United States, and that Native women are murdered at a rate 10 times the national average. For those of us within Verizon who work closely with Indian Country, the Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women and Girls Movement, or MMIWG movement, is one that we have been familiar with. But in preparation for today's discussion, we got a glimpse of the complexity and enormity of this crisis and realized there is so much more to understand. To help us understand the history behind this crisis, the ongoing efforts to break the silence surrounding it, and share how we as individuals and corporations can become allies with the MMIWG movement are our guest panelists. Lucy Rain Simpson, and Jordan Marie brings three white horses, Daniel. Lucy is a member of the Navajo Nation and the executive director of the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center, or NIWRC. She brings a wealth of legal and public policy experience as an attorney in Indian country for nearly 20 years. Before joining NIWRC, Lucy was a public policy coordinator and staff attorney for the Indian Law Resource Center where she worked to address the epidemic of violence against Native women. She has substantial experience working with Indian nations to promote tribal sovereignty, tribal code development, and protecting Native women and their families. Welcome, Lucy. Jordan is a member of the Lower Brule Sioux Tribe and the founder and executive director of Rising Hearts, an indigenous-led grassroots group designated to elevate awareness of indigenous issues and the intersectionality of all movements impacting brown, black, and indigenous communities. She is a passionate advocate for Indian country and all people and is known for her grassroots activism around anti-pipeline, climate justice, and missing and murdered indigenous women. Among her many leadership roles, 
Jordan is a Runner World Alliance ambassador and uses her running platform to help wear, raise awareness on numerous social justice activities, including MMIWG and Black Lives Matter. Welcome, Jordan. Lucy and Jordan, we appreciate both of you being here today and to help us all learn more about your work to end the silent crisis of the missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. I'd like to begin now with our first question, and that will be for you, Lucy. Okay. Can you tell us, thank you. Can you tell us more about the background and context of the crisis of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls, and any additional data or statistics about this crisis? Well, thank you, um, first of all, for, um, for inviting myself and Jordan to be a part of this important panel. Um, uh, Yat A, my name is Lucy Simpson. I'm a citizen of the Navajo Nation. Um, and I think it's really important, you know, this question is I'd probably, um, you know, such an important first step in understanding this crisis, uh, the background of, of why we're seeing um, such a high rate of murdered and missing indigenous women and girls across the country. Um, this crisis is not new. It's um, has deep roots in the colonization and genocide of Native people and the lack of legal protections for Native women that's a result of the systemic erosion of tribal sovereignty stretching back more than 500 years since first contact. The, the reality is that American Indian and Alaskan Native women today face some of the highest rates of domestic violence and sexual assault in the United States. And as you mentioned, um, federal statistics report that the murder rate of American Indian women is more than 10 times the national average. Um, so it's it's a it's a crisis that's not new, but it, but I think crisis sometimes makes us think that it's something recent and something new. But this mm -hmm. is systemic, um, going back to first colonization. The the federal laws, some of them passed you know centuries ago, continue to govern the lives and safety mm -hmm. of Native women. And these laws have created legal loopholes, which oftentimes allow non-Native abusers and predators to target Native women and girls with impunity. Um, so, you know, this movement, uh, a movement of surviving families and grassroots advocates for missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, and also our two-spirit relatives across the United States, is, is about, first and foremost, we have to create awareness, but that's not the end goal. Uh, we're not calling for public acknowledgement that these crimes are happening against Native people. What we're asking for and what we're demanding is public accountability to hold these failed systems accountable and responsible so that not one more Indigenous life is taken. Lucy, for sharing that. Um, creating awareness, public accountability, um, those will be two key topics for our discussion today. And we'll go into that, that topic a little bit later. Uh, for Jordan, I wanted to ask about how you got involved with this movement um, and becoming an advocate and raising awareness around this discussion, around this topic. Yeah, thank you so much and speaking to that. Um, you know, I really got involved in terms of just listening, listening to stories and asking questions and recognizing from a young age, senior year in high school, about to go to college, go back home to South Dakota and see all my relatives. And, um, you know, the young woman went missing and my mom was part of that search party. And that was the beginning moment um, of recognizing that this isn't just an isolated incident and recognizing the amount of, you know, funerals, you know, that I've been to and that have happened in our community um, you know, it was abnormal, um, you know, felt like it was more than anyone else should be doing, uh, experiencing that loss and grief within our communities, and something that we all know, and something that actually brings us together as community to be there for each other. But I started asking questions and finding out some of the stories of some of our relatives we've lost and, you know, being taken from violence and, um, you know, various ways that that has happened. And so I recognize that this isn't just within my own family, this isn't just within my own community. And when I started traveling, um, you know, through my jobs, I started hearing more stories and seeing that this is just 
something that is happening across Indian country, across Turtle Island. And my freshman year of college, I learned about the Highway of Tears. And back then that was the fall of 2006. So there wasn't, um, to my knowledge, the, the hashtag MMIW or um, you know, the name Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, but our First Nations relatives really leading this movement and advocacy to hold the government accountable and really push for justice and healing for their families. And then I just started paying attention more and started doing the research, started pushing myself to ask those questions, feeling like I knew some of the answers and you kind of don't want to have to come to face with the reality of it. Um, and so when I attended my first rally in DC, the Reject and Protect to Stop the Key XL Pipeline, I heard an indigenous woman speak to the man camps and the high rates of violence of human drug sex trafficking happening and a story of rescuing, you know, a little girl as young as eight years old from fleeing a man camp. And then I was just like, you know, I can't just talk about this or share a post or reshare these organizations that are doing this work. I can't just, you know, I have to do more. And so I started, you know, following all the accounts I could possible that included NIWRC, that included so many others, um, started reading the report, started signing up for email lists and started really trying to immerse myself into the data that is available and that was there, which I also saw was really lacking in terms of federal um, and just really signed up for any opportunity to hear the advocates, to hear the family speak um, about their loved ones and started organizing prayer vigils. And 2019 comes along and after having organized these things to bring community together, to center indigenous voices and those that could speak to their loved ones and bringing community together that way, it felt like it was constantly only being talked about among indigenous voices and feeling like the outside world who are non-native, non-indigenous didn't care about native people because we are always fighting our own erasure across so many issues and feeling like just our lives are expendable, that we are targets, that we are more vulnerable. Um, you know, I kind of lost hope and faith in humanity about caring about human lives. And so after trying so hard and so much, I wanted to give back through prayer because I participated in prayer runs. And the 2019 Boston Marathon was, you know, the opportunity of culmination of events and frustration and heartache and pain um, and being you know reconnected with family um, Brittany Tiger justice for Brittany Tiger my cousin and you know just feeling frustrated and so I wanted to give back through prayer and say their name out loud to creator to offer prayer for them and their family and our communities and for our next generations and wanted to create that intentional space for them and that's when my whole life changed that's when my running had new purpose and the intersection of advocacy and and my passion of running has been my life ever since. It's not just having these conversations on a panel. It's not just having these conversations within activism spaces. This is integrating it into every avenue of my life um, and really trying to create intentional space that way for people to learn about these issues, to highlight the voices, um, to highlight the hard work that is all part of this movement. And it's something that I am so grateful for and really just blessed to be able to do. That I remember, you know, so I've been working with tribal nations for many years now for Verizon. And I remember hearing about a runner who was running for this issue. And I never knew that was you. So I was really excited to get to meet you. And and to let you know that as a non-Native American, I am indigenous, but as a non-Native American, um, you, your efforts were being heard, you know, and, and so it's an honor to be able to moderate this discussion with the both of you, because the work that not just your organizations are doing, but the work that you're doing is, is truly making a difference. And we're pleased that Verizon is here to help be a platform to help you with your voices and in, in being heard about this so that it spreads to those who you know, have never heard about this. Um, we touch, or both of you touched a little bit on the government and policies. I'd like to discuss that just a little bit further and go into that and explain to our audience what that means. Um, now Secretary of Interior, Deb Holland, 
um, sponsored legislation on the MMIWG issue. Can you tell us more about the Not Invisible Act that, that, that she sponsored and what it is about and what is, what is it going to achieve or, or impact? And Lucy, maybe if you could start with that. And, and Jordan, feel free to add anything additional if you see fit. Okay. Um, yeah, I can do that. Thanks. Um, and I just want to, um, you know, appreciate uh, Jordan's um, words and efforts and um, and prayers on and her her activity activities to to create some intentional space and that that's so important um, in this work. Um, and it's lifting up the voices of those oftentimes who who don't have those platforms. And so it's uh, again, you know, that this panel. Um, and our ability to to partner with Verizon for this is is so important. Um, but getting back to your question about um, now Secretary of Interior Deb Holland sponsored legislation, the Not Invisible Act. Um, it's uh, federal legislation that calls for the Interior Department to coordinate uh, prevention efforts, um, grant funding for resources and programs related to missing and murdered. Indigenous people in the United States, um, and a lot of that is based on the federal trust responsibility that the federal government has towards um, Indian tribes and their citizens. Um, the purpose of the Not Invisible Act is to identify and combat violence, cr violent crime against Native people or uh, violent crimes within tribal lands through the creation of an advisory committee. Um, this committee is intended to be made up of tribal leaders law enforcement, federal partners, service providers, as well as survivors um, who would then make recommendations to the U.S. Department of Interior and the Department of Justice to um, better combat violence against Native Americans and Alaska Natives. Um, what I think is so important about this legislation is, um, and this advisory committee is that it's um, inclusive of tribal leadership as well as survivors um, and family members. Um, you know, I, we, we have yet to see what, um, you know, who will be on the advisory committee, but that's the, the, the intent and, and purpose of it. Um, so many times when there's activities happening at the federal level, you know, they'll pull together some federal officials who might not even have the, the background or expertise or, or real knowledge of this issue, but they're high up in their department and they pull them in to sort of serve as um, a on task force members or um, advisory members, but they don't have that connection to how it really impacts the everyday lives of, of community members. Um, and so the fact that this is supposed to include tribal leadership um, and survivors and include their voices and you know, what the challenges that they've faced in seeking justice for their family members is, is, is important and it's 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 fairly new to um, to this field and so I think that's why um, it, it's you know I think a lot of us in, in Indian country a lot of us who work um, in the field of um, ending violence against Native women and children um, are, are really hopeful about what the Not Invisible Act will do. Of course, that's not going to be the the solution, but um, it, it's part of it. It's a step in the right direction. Our understanding is that um, Secretary Holland now that she's within you know, the Department of Interior and, and heading the Department of Interior that she's um, working on implementing components of the legislation. Um, we're listening for what those next steps will be um, and, and feeling a lot more confident that um, Interior and Federal Department will honor its treaties with tribal nations, fulfill its trust responsibilities to tribes um, and you know, we're going to continue to advocate that the United States act in a uh, government to government relationship towards tribes and um, any actions that they take are um, are with, you know, have been discussed with us, um, with our tribal leadership, but that we're um, um, that we're, you know, supportive of it. Um, I think that's that's so much of the um, what's been lacking um, for so long is that the federal government comes in and you know, through this plenary power of um, a court-created doctrine based on the Commerce Clause of the U.S. Constitution, um, the court, Supreme Court has basically said that Congress has, you know, plenary power. They can do whatever they think is in the best interests of Indians. And oftentimes the way they did that is with, you know, just taking action that didn't um, actually inform, consult, um, 
um, Indians and oftentimes were not in our best interests. So um, having Secretary Holland heading up the Department of Interior, she understands that this history. She's lived this history. Um, so I'm, you know, I think so many of us um, are really hopeful that we're going to see um, see more more action, more intentional action um, to help not only improve the response to missing and murdered Indigenous girls um, and the the full spectrum of violence against Native women, but also um, uh, really be um, putting at the forefront um, prevention and putting resources into our communities to be able to to do that. So we know that we have the Not Invisible Act. Has there been anything else that has helped, you know, any other laws that have been passed that have helped to address this? You mentioned improving the response um, to yeah. when somebody is reported missing. Um, how how has these laws or are there is there anything that has been impacted that has already started to affect this? Yeah, well, you know, I think history can't be undone, but changes to current federal laws can increase safety for Native women. Um, while Native women represent a small percentage of the U.S. population, we're mighty. We have grassroots advocates, tribes and families um, all working together, and we've made you know, significant progress in the work for safety for Native women. Of course, it's not over, um, and it's, you know, we're still having families who are, um, are dealing with this heartbreak and are still getting, um, you know, not seeing justice for their family members, but we're seeing some, some improvements um, despite the social and structural challenges of, of visibility that I think Jordan mentioned earlier about the erasure of our, our people um, in, you know, modern society. And also, um, in spite of you know the challenges of racism and discrimination that um, that we face as Native people, um, you know a couple things that we've we've seen some positive actions that um, that were again are, are fairly new that we're hopeful will create some um, positive change. As last summer, we saw the U.S. Supreme Court in the McGirt decision affirm tribal boundaries of the Muscogee Creek Nation in Oklahoma. Uh, which helps ensure the tribe can fully exercise tribal criminal authority over certain crimes against Native women, um, which was restored under the Violence Against uh, Women Act. And we haven't talked too much about it, but a lot of the legal loopholes that I mentioned earlier are around um, jurisdiction, who can prosecute a crime that happens in Indian country. And, um, you know, there are a lot of loopholes in that for, for Indian um, people. And in, in most states, you know, you you're not from that state, but you drive into that state's jurisdiction, you commit a crime, that state has authority over you. It's not the same in Indian country. Um, there's this whole complex um, system of questions that they have to determine um, to figure out who, at, who, who can even respond to any kind of crime. Um, you have to find out, you know, did it happen on, on, on tribal lands, you know, within tribal um, authority on the reservation? Um, what kind of crime was it? Was it a major crime? Was it, you know, uh, domestic violence is often considered misdemeanor, so it doesn't fall within that major crime um, consideration when, um, and, and major crimes, the federal government has jurisdiction. Um, and then also who, who's the perpetrator and who is the victim? Are they, are they Native? Are they um, Indians? Um, when it comes to missing and murdered Indigenous women, you know, those are often questions that we can't answer upfront. You know, we don't, you know, particularly in, in the situations of um, a woman who's gone missing, you know, we don't know if, if, if the, 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 the reason behind that, if um, the location of that was on um, tribal land. We don't know um, who the perpetrator was to be able to make that determination. So oftentimes, you know, jurisdictions are sort of unsure of who should be responding. Um, it's complicated. They you know, they, they don't have the answers to these questions, and sometimes it means that they just don't act. And, um, you know, so it's when our tribal governments can exercise authority to protect their own citizens, that's our ideal, um, you know, that, that's what, one of the things that we're working for. Um, right now, tribes cannot, um, don't have authority in a lot of situations. Um, to be able to exercise jurisdiction, 
particularly they can't um, exercise jurisdiction over a non-Indian who commits a crime against a Native woman. So if you have um, Native men, you know, who often, um, you know, are, you know, have gotten to the point where they feel they can commit these crimes with impunity because the tribal government can't prosecute them. If it's not a major crime and it's, you know, domestic violence and considered a misdemeanor, um, the, the federal government won't prosecute them and the tribe can't prosecute them. The state has no jurisdiction in the country. So they can commit these crimes over and over and over again. And it, um, and, and it, it just, there's, there's no justice for our community members. So the Violence Against Women Act in 2013 was reauthorized to include a partial restoration of tribal um, inherent authority to prosecute crimes of domestic violence uh, that are committed against Native women by non-Indians. And that is a huge step in the right direction, but we can't stop there. We have crimes of sexual assault that are not included, um, crimes of sex trafficking, um, um, all the crimes against children that are not included. So we have to keep, um, you know, keep working towards that full restoration of jurisdiction for our tribal governments because, you know, um, for NIWRC, uh, we believe that um, safety and sovereignty go hand in hand. Um, our tribal governments have to have the recognized authority to protect their citizens, and um, and that creates safety for our Native women. And when our women are safe, then our communities can thrive because women form the backbone of our communities. They're the foundation of our families. Um, women in the land are connected. They're both, you know, the first um, first mother for um, um, for um, for our communities, and so we have to ensure that our tribal governments have that authority. Um, a couple other, you know, in addition to the Not Invisible Act, um, another act, Savannah's Act, um, finally um, became law after years of grassroots advocacy by the um, by murdered and missing Indigenous um, activists. And in November, we had a, a historic number of Native women elected to Congress, um, and I think that's really important for visibility and upholding the value of indigenous women's leadership. When we see native women in these leadership positions, it, um, you know, it, it does something for that erasure of our, of our communities that we've experienced at, at so many levels um, in, in modern society. And, um, and again, you know, Deb Holland being appointed to the, um, to the Department of the Interior, I think is a, a historic um, move, especially when we consider the Department of Interior Interior is historically one of the most oppressive departments uh, within um, the federal government, and has done so much damage to um, to our lands and um, and 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 our people in 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 history. Jordan, for you, with the work that you've been doing, has have you seen any, you know, is there anything you want to add about this? And, and has there been any progress that you've seen um, as a result, if there's anything you have to add? I mean, it's not, a lot of information that that's out there that Lucy yeah. just shared. Yeah, for sure. I mean, really, the only thing I can just not even add, but just emphasize is that we need to be part of that process, the families, the survivors, the advocates really need to be part of the development of when legislation is being proposed, the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act, task forces, everything that is created, the new Missing and Murdered Indigenous Persons Unit, everything that is part of that, it has to center specifically, I think, on the advocates and the families. Um, because if they are not part of that process, this never ending cycle, this perpetual cycle of long historic standing violence is going to continue and we have to just do everything possible to ensure that their voices are being heard on those platforms so i think discussions like this um, creating events and community spaces and creating awareness about that is anyone out there that wants to you know organize something or you know co-lead something you need to ensure especially when it's about missing and murdered indigenous girls um, and our relatives, you need to ensure that you have spaces for their voices to be in that conversation. And this comes down to the whole, um, you know, issues of what tribal consultation versus meaningful tribal consultation that still applies to the families and the survivors and the advocates as part of that. So I can't emphasize that enough. Thank you. The I remember as we were 
prepping for this discussion, I saw a statistic and I, and I was trying to find it. If you saw me moving around, it was because I was trying to find that information. But off the top of my head, I remember it, it said something around 2016, the year 2016, it was around 5,700 Native women were reported missing, um, but only less than 200 made it to the federal reporting, federal registry. And it sounds like this is a systemic problem caused by the lack of policies and laws and where jurisdiction takes place and, and all the complicated background that's involved in being able to report somebody missing and who can who can take over the you know the search for it. I hear that a lot of times, you know, as you mentioned, Lucy, both you and Jordan mentioned, it, it lands on the family. The family becomes the search party. The family becomes the public safety people trying to find the missing family member. And so hopefully, you know, as as our audience is listening to this and if they hear about policies or they have influence in with their local governments or especially with the federal governments and and can lend insight to this discussion or lend another, you know, another level of support and saying this is important we need to talk about this we need to get the right people involved to address this hopefully there will be that trickle effect as a result of this conversation and this awareness so thank you both that that um for addressing that question um lucy you mentioned about co-partnering and i know in previous discussions we talked about allyship and co and co-conspirators it's a word that you that you used um, for those of us who are watching and those of us who are Native or even especially more non-Native, uh, what does it mean to be an ally or a co-conspirator? What does that look like? Um, and if you can just expand on that a little bit more. Um, well, this, this is Lucy, and I, I think that the co-conspirator is something that Jordan was was talking about. I apologize. That was our, Jordan. Our <laughs> so, um, yes, thank you. So I don't want to jump in. I'll let Jordan um, uh, take that one. Yeah, thank you. Um, the name co-conspirator is something more new to me and something that I feel really um, embodies in that, you know, trickle or ripple effect of change that we really need to happen to address these issues and to protect our communities and our women and our girls. And it's really being especially for those that are non-native non-indigenous really being involved in this with us and being able to feel as we do and having that motivate you and inspire you to keep pushing to keep fighting to be a loud voice with us while still being able to center the indigenous native voices um but really just having it be part of your life and hopefully it leads to being able as advocates, you know, as um, relatives, being able to alleviate some of that stress or financial burden or any of those responsibilities that I feel like always is landing on the families and being able to show up and really influence systemic change that we need. And so I think anyone can be an ally, uh, and especially, you know, in the last couple of years, we've been seeing that word used a lot. And, I am really protective of those I work with, those I support and want to be um, continuing to support in our community and our families. And I just really feel that, you know, being a co-conspirator really um, is, the next, is the next level up um, because time and time again, we've seen people in our movements show up and then I'm always left with, are you still gonna be here a year from now? Still angered about this, still motivated to do this. And then it's like cricket sometimes. Um, so it's it's making sure that we can call people in, have them learn from us, have them you know participate in these things with us when we're advocating and being part of these opportunities to really be there with us and fight for change. Thank you. And Lucy, thank you for for correcting me. <laughs> I'm so sorry, but uh... You know, taking that allyship um, conversation just a step further, for corporations like Verizon, um, how can we, you know, so we have Citizen Verizon. Um, a lot of corporations have 
you know, their corporate citizen platforms. Um, how can corporations like Verizon authentically integrate this MMIWG discussion or movement into our corporate citizen platforms? Um, Lucy, if you if you don't mind, you know, starting with that question, with that answer. Thank you. Sure. Um, you know, I think that there's a number of different um, ways that corporate platforms can can be helpful, and um, you know, even just not even specific to the MMIW uh, movement, but you know, just what we've been talking about a little bit earlier, this issue of erasure. Um, of Native peoples in modern society. Um, I think there's a, a social tolerance in the public space that allows for the sexualization of Native women and that leads to a disregard for the value of our, of our lives, this idea that we're something of the past. Um, and, um, you know, generally speaking, Native people, we have to fight to be seen um, and, and acknowledged as a part of modern society. Um, and oftentimes when we are seen, companies and brands um, exploit our Native heritage, exploit our cultures and, and our trauma, um, and especially of Native women who are constantly sexualized and fetished. Um, and, you know, we see this off, you know, with a lot of the, the movement that's um, been happening for um, Native mascots. And, and um, um, so, you know, there's, America has a history of culture of misogyny um, and the fetish is fetishization of women of color and indigenous women in particular. And I think that that um, contributes to the violence that um, Native women experience, no question. It's this, um, that, um, this diminishment of our value, this diminishment of us as, um, as, as a real part of um, the American fabric. Um, so I think um, including our voices, our faces is, is important. Um, and that's one easy thing that um, corporations can, can do to, to begin um, recognizing the, the value of, of, of Native people in general that also um, um, will um, you know, increase our visibility um, and, and work towards ending that um, ongoing erasure of, of Native women in particular. Um, so that's, I think, you know, the first step. Um, and I'm not sure, Jordan, if you have some other contributions to, to, the, to the conversation on, on this issue. Yeah, I think it's really just about, you know, uh, being able to have these opportunities to cultivate community and these platforms to have our voices, our communities be centered and to speak to these issues because like I mentioned before, we're constantly fighting our own erasure. We have stereotypes, we have generalizations, we have all of these, um, you know, ideologies about Native Americans and like us only existing before 1900, you know, the way textbooks are incredibly whitewashed and kind of paints us as a figure of the past and not part of modern society. We need to make sure that we can speak to these and have indigenous people rewrite the narrative and having, us have the the driver's seat in that discussion um and so i think you know corporations support helping to you know lead and facilitate a panel like this just really shows community in my eyes and that's just one incredible powerful way for, to support you know the organizations and the voices across all of these issues and spaces that we're, we're trying to address Thank you both. And I hope that those in the audience listening to this will, you know, take some key points. I think there's a lot of good, good, you know, points that both of you shared that that we can take back. Um, so switching topics just a little bit, um, May 5th. May 5th is an important day. And for those of us who are non-native, um, we immediately think of May 5th as Cinco de Mayo. Uh, for Indigenous advocates, it has a different and special meaning. And Lucy, I wanted to know if you could tell us a little bit more about why May 5th is significant and what exactly is happening on that day. Yeah, um, so um, grassroots advocates and surviving families of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls have um, lifted May 5th 
as the day to serve as the National Day of Awareness for MMIWG. Uh, May 5th is the birthday of um, Hannah Harris, who was 21 years old when she went missing um, on the Northern Cheyenne Reservation in 2013 and was later found murdered. She was a member of the Northern Cheyenne Tribe um, and um, the area that she went missing um, was, um, oh, my, my video, I think. Are you still seeing my video? Okay, I, I, it, I lost it on my end. Um, my mute was off, but we could see, we okay. could hear you still. Okay. Thank you. So the area where she went missing is also, um, you know, the headquarters for NIWRC is in Lame Deer, Montana, which is where um, Hannah Harris was from. So the, the choice of May 5th um, is really to honor, um, honor her. And um, it was, you know, since, her murder, her mother, Melinda Harris Limberhan, and other families and advocates and tribes have really risen to the challenge um, to, to end the silence and the tolerance and the inaction when it comes to the response to um, our murdered and missing relatives. Um, and so um, Hannah um, or Melinda Harris has done a lot of work to, um, to raise awareness, and it was really her um, advocacy within the state of Montana and getting the Montana congressional delegation um, starting to listen. Um, you know, this isn't, 2013 is, um, you know, is, is around the time when this issue really started to gain national traction, but it's been um, something that you know, our communities have been experiencing, as I mentioned before, since first contact. Um, one of the, the um, tactics of colonization was to attack um, the Native women because they knew it would break down the, the tribal communities. And so this is something that we've been experiencing for a long time, um, but it wasn't until 2013 with Melinda Harris and, um, and the advocates within um, Montana that really got the attention of, of the Montana congressional delegation who, um, who really started to, um, to listen and um, Work to create this National Day of Awareness, and it was um, May 5th was was chosen in honor of Hannah Harris's birthday. So um, that's why we um, you know, we hold up and organize organize around May 5th each year. Um, advocates rise up to honor and call for justice for Hannah Harris, as well as um, the other missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls who um, whose families are still fighting for justice. And and also I think. Um, Jordan and Rising uh, Hearts are organizing a virtual run on, on May 5th, on the, and it's called Running for Justice. Do you have some more to share about that, Jordan? Yeah, yeah, I can. Um, this is our fourth year hosting um, an event on May 5th, and our second year really um, being able to support and give back to National Indigenous Women's Resource Center. Um, last year, we were in the pandemic, so it was me running by myself, but sharing it virtually and really trying to get community to donate, give back to NIWRC. And this year, um, we have an incredible partner and friends of mine from College of Elite Feeds working with us to host multiple virtual runs to really fundraise to give back to these amazing organizations. And so it was really easy to pitch to them this idea of let's host a virtual run for May 5th. and have it be over a series of a few days. So it gives everyone the opportunity to be able to participate and um, you know, having the registration link come out really early so we can try and fundraise as much as we can because our goal is to donate and give back um, in really big ways as, as well as making um, several other donation, smaller donations to other heartworking organizations and individuals, um, specifically, um, the family of the woman that my mom was part of that search party, Victoria Eagleman, um, been been staying in touch with her and really want to support her. Um, and so this is just a way to really cultivate community to make sure the registration page is as resourceful and informative as possible. It's not just your typical registration page. It has resources and links to download, reports to download. And then we've also created um, a supplemental 
Missing and Murdered Indigenous Relatives website on our Rising Hearts website to really amplify all of that NIRWC is doing and all of the May 5th events and the webinars to sign up for and to sign the petition as well as other events that are happening starting today until May 9th. Um, all of the discussions, podcasts to listen to, films to watch, as well as really highlighting other organizations that are in this space and um, doing this work. And so it's been really incredible. It's everyone's getting really excited. We're starting to get tags and shares and everyone getting their bib, which with Malachi earlier shared me, shared with me the like registration bib. Um, so those are starting to get mailed out. We have um, shirts available. The artwork was created by Vernon Key worked with uh, Natives Outdoors and really just created something that really embodies what I would like to see um, in our future is, you know, us being able to run for justice and run for the families in honor and remembrance, um, but also sending a clear message that enough is enough and no more stolen relatives. And um, we need to move forward in a good way and create a better and safer future for our next generations to have. And so just really grateful to be on this panel to be able to use this platform and my personal platform to be able to give back to NIWRC and really um, creating a beautiful relationship between our two wards. Well, I think that's fantastic, everything that you have planned for that day. And I know we're going to be wearing red on on May 5th is part of, you know, our support for the, you know, for this movement and this event and, and that the special meaning for that day. Um, with Hannah Harris. Um, Lucy, I know there's a lot that NIWRC is also doing. It's actually a week-long event um, yeah. of, I, of things going on. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, so um, at NIWRC, we're committed to lifting the voices of surviving family members like Melinda Harris, the mother of Hannah Harris, to hold um, failed systems accountable and responsible for the abductions and murders of um, our Native women and girls in our communities. And one of the things that we're, we're doing um, to, to try and raise some awareness right now is we're kicking off the National Week of Action, which is, starts today and it goes through May 5th. Um, and we have a number of, um, of briefings going on and, and different activities happening during this week. Um, so uh, we have a partnerships, a, a national partners work group on MMIWG that we've been working with um, to, to organize this full National Week of Action. Um, the week-long campaign calls for the nation to, um, 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 to, to begin taking steps to honor missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls um, so that we can improve the response, but also um, begin to um, uh, ensure the resources for um, for preventing further uh, missing and murdered Indigenous girls. You can go to our website. We have a full list of all the virtual events that are happening, all the activities. Um, it's on our website at niwrc.org. Um, we, I, and I think um, the, the sponsors of this panel will um, have the links to the websites out there for you. Um, we're encouraging everyone on this call, um, um, individuals, organizations, allies in action, as well as you know, co-conspirators, co as Jordan says, to um, participate in some of these virtual events, um, and to also think about organizing additional um, actions in your community on or around May 5th. Um, and we're asking you to join us in saying enough is enough, as Jordan said, um, not one more stolen sister. Um, we're encouraging our allied organizations to sign on to a resolution for the May 5th National Day of Awareness for MMIWG. Um, unfortunately, it's, uh, um, it has to be um, uh, reaffirmed every year, the, the National Day of Awareness. So each year we, we do some organizing and advocacy and um, have a petition and um, a resolution to get Congress to, to continue um, designating May 5th as a National Day of Awareness, um, and, and that's available on our website as well. Um, and, and we're also asking for community members, allies, um, to wear red on May 5th, and you can share photos of yourselves on social media. Um, we actually have a No More Stolen Sisters poster on, um, that you can download on our website, and, um, and, and I'm going to see if I can 
change my um, my screen that shows what that um, what that poster looks like, um, and you can print that off um, and and use that. Um, you know, or you know, hope you follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. We we provide a lot of information, a lot of um, um, webinars, briefings, um, and and have a lot of resources for those of you who are interested in learning more about. Um, about the, the jurisdictional loopholes as well as a lot of the actions um, that, that are happening at the legislative level to try and address this, this issue. Um, and we have a newsletter um, that you can sign up for on our website. Um, I think the most important thing though is you know we're, we're asking people to wear, wear red to, to, to join these activities um, and, and, and as I mentioned I think at the beginning raising awareness is um, an important first step, um, but you know, as you know, with with Jordan's term of, of co-conspirators, it really implies being in it with us. Um, so we 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 don't want it to end, and, and people to think that you know you 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 wear red, you you know you take a selfie, that that's enough. It, it's um, you know awareness is important. It, it's it's so important. It's critical. Um, but we you know that's not the goal of of of, of any of this work, the goal really is to demand accountability and systems change and justice for our our native um, community members, for families of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls who are still um, getting um, roadblocks and 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 deny justice for their family members. So um, so um, I think that's a you know that's a lot of information and and all the links I think should be. Should be in the the chat box for you to to get more information. Um, oh, yeah, also, I know that. Um, I was oh, just going to add we um, we had a congressional briefing um, this morning, a virtual congressional briefing with Senators Lisa Murkowski and Catherine um, Masto, um, um, and they um, participated in that. And I believe that will be available on their website um, as well that you can watch and download at your convenience. I think um, you know. Seeing and hearing um, from our um, our federal partners and and understanding that you know, these federal partners, their um, these federal agencies, Congress, it's um, you know they they have a, a specific responsibility to um, to Indian tribes through um, the trust responsibility through treaties and um, and if we can all understand that um, and and really um, encourage. Um, our government to to implement that trust responsibility in a good way. Um, I think that's really important. Thank you so much. There's there's the, that week of events. There's a lot going on, and we yeah. do have it in the chat box and on and on the registration link at um, at our Tech Futures website. I think it's listed there as well. But uh, it's an important day. I, I and I know we have some questions and we appreciate it. I believe we have two questions in our Q&A box. Uh, so I'm going to turn this over to Malachi to ask those questions. And um, Malachi, if you can turn your camera on. Perfect, <clears throat> perfect. Um, thank you, Jordan and Lucy. Uh, definitely appreciate it. And just taking a look into the chat box, I see a lot of compliments from everyone. So <clears throat> again, thank you all for joining us here. So the first question we have, it comes from Erica, um, and she's asking, I'm a native Cherokee woman living away from my native community. How can we be effectively involved from afar in this cause? Um, well, I can I can start and then I think um, I'll, I'll, I'll kick it over to Jordan. Um, I, you know, there's, there's so many native um, native citizens that live outside of their traditional territories that live in urban areas off their reservations um, and our you know our, our native citizenship our um, our native communities don't end at the reservation border um, and so um, you know we encourage everyone to um, to get involved no matter um, whether you living in your native community or not um, you know we there, one thing about us as, as Native people is we, um, you know, family is so important. Um, community is so important to us. And 
whether we are um, in our, you know, on our reservation community with our, you know, blood family and clan family um, and society family, or whether we're living in another urban area, Minneapolis, Los Angeles, wherever, um, we find each other and, and we create community in those spaces. Um, and so I think that, um, you know, no matter where you are, that, you know, it, when we find something that we feel um, passionate about, we, you know, just like you know, Jordan um, taking this issue and, and, and creating this um, amazing um, platform that she's done, you know, once we, um, we, we talk about it with our, our family members, our community members, and, um, and, and, and getting involved, holding prayer vigils, um, those are all things that are, are really, um, you know, I, I think that sometimes we, we think that to have a real impact, we have to be, you know, at this certain level of, of talking to, you know, federal officials or doing, you know, and then, and that's, that's one small part of it. Um, you know, we wouldn't be anywhere we are if it wasn't for the community members, the grassroots advocates who really um, lift up the voices um, of their, of, of their, um, people, of their families, and so um, I think there's, you know, there's no end to what anyone um, can do. Um, I would just encourage you to, you know, wherever you are, reach out to a local advocacy organization. Um, you know, depending on where you live, there might be um, urban Indian organizations there that um, you can partner with. Um, if not, there are probably, um, you know, um, domestic violence, tribal, um, you know, whether it's tribal or, you know, native or non-native, um, urban Indian health organizations or not, um, and, and, and see if there are opportunities for, um, for action. So I think that's great that you're, um, you're interested in, in getting involved. That's really what this is all about. Jordan, did you want to add anything or? Yeah, I can add just something quick is that, um, you know, we tend to think when we have to show up or be able to do something or participate in something, it, I feel like a lot of people will automatically think of rallies and marches and the occupation of these sites or, um, you know, something that has to be big and loud. Uh, there are so many other incredible voices that, you know, are more behind the scenes and, and that's how the work is getting done. And, you know, I found, you know, my passion or niche for this advocacy through running and there are so many others that are intersecting their passion of advocacy and what they want to take action and support on through their own sports you have rosalie fish who does it with running you have other runners that are doing it you have basketball players volleyball players it could be anything um, that you have a deep connection to that you can use to create this intentional space to give awareness to what you're passionate about. It doesn't have to be your typical standing on a soapbox with a microphone or a bullhorn. Um, there's so much. It could be through poetry. It could be through music. It can be through anything. Um, and that's something that I truly feel like even me being away from my homeland and my community. Um, luckily, we find community wherever we go, I feel like. I feel like I'm always able to find at least one native um, even in big cities like Los Angeles, and luckily I'm really grateful to have a big community here, but um, it's finding whatever you're passionate about and, and being able to, um, you know, intersect the two. And it, it can be big or it can be small, but when enough of us are doing it, it creates that ripple effect of change that, you know, I, I truly think is really happening and change is happening. Thank you. And it looks like Shania, uh, for joining it, she's asking, as a professional Native athlete, any suggestions on the best way to become actively involved to raise awareness and support the fight against the crisis? So. Yeah. Um, talk about it. You know, uh, ignore the comments where folks say, leave politics out of sport. You know, that's something that I get a lot, something that I know my little sister Rosalie has, you know, spoken to and it's being able to speak to it and including it in whatever you do. And so, like I said, if you're a runner, if you're a basketball player, we have so many, you know, from young in high school to college to professional that are all giving awareness to what is important to us. And 
that's what you need to do is just start talking about it. And it may make people feel uncomfortable. That's because they're not informed. They don't know about these issues. And um, this is just one creative way to be able to inform the community. Perfect, thank you. And Kuala, I think we have time for one more question. Um, and it, it's a very important question, it seems to be. And the question would be, I, for Lucy, I'm assuming, it would, how can we hold indigenous men and male tribal leaders accountable? And this is coming from Ashley. Uh, Ashley, excuse me. Oh. Am I? There we go. There you um, go. I think that's a really important question. Um, and and it, it goes to, um, you know, so much of traditionally in our native communities, our, our women were honored and respected, um, our women were held as sacred. Um, you know, our creation stories um, talk about the, the role of, of women as sacred um, and the, um, you know, the, the role that you, know, you can't have ceremony without a um, man and a woman. Um, you know, they both have their parts within, within any kind of traditional ceremony. And we have our, um, you know, that, that value that, um, that we have in a lot of our native communities are matrilineal or matriarchal. Um, and through colonization, we've, um, we've lost some of that. Um, and, and also through this ongoing erasure and diminishment of the value of, of, of native women and native lives in general, um, you know, there's this idea that um, you know we're sort of moving away from that. Um, I think doing a lot of work within our communities to um, restore those foundational um, ideas and foundational philosophies of of our of our people that our, our women are sacred. Um, we are the backbone of our communities, um, and um, we have a connection to the land, um, and uh, to be able to um, to um, get back to that place of respect um, and honoring of our women, then we, you know, we're able to build those foundations for strong communities. We're able to, to build those foundations where we can see um, the ability to um, combat a lot of the historical trauma that we've experienced. We're able to begin that healing process. Um, so that's a really important um, part of that of, you know, Ensuring that we're teaching our our, our young people um, about our, our our roles in our community, teaching them our ceremonies, our traditions, and talking to them about the importance of 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 that. Um, and that I think is an important step that's often left out of the conversation. Um, you know, oftentimes you know we're talking about what can the federal government do, and there are things that they need to do, but a lot of that work needs to happen. Um, in our own communities and getting back to those values of, of women as sacred, children as sacred, our elders are sacred. Um, and we have to um, not just talk about it, but live it and teach it to, um, to our community members and share those values. And, and I think that's a, a really important thing that, um, that everyone um, in our native communities can do um, and, and begin really focusing on on a daily basis. Um, and, and, and we'll see some some dramatic um, positive changes just with that. And then, you know, we add on the different layers of, um, of you know, training our, our leadership on the dynamics of domestic violence, um, holding our leadership accountable for, um, for actions in, you know, that might happen in their homes, in their communities, um, ensuring that we have judges and law enforcement that are you know, putting resources to that so that they know how to um, respond in an appropriate sort of way, um, a culturally appropriate way, but also um, you know, not victim blaming. There's so many different things that, um, that we need to do, but I think that foundation is getting back to that, um, that respect for our women and children is sacred. Thanks, Lucy. Clearly, that's it for the questions. And before I turn it over to you, I just wanted to say thank you again to both Jordan and Lucy to being a part of our panel. And for those who are on uh, the call who are Verizon employees, uh, feel free to reach out to NAV. We're happy to discuss further ways we can support the movement. And um, we're always looking for creative opportunities um, to make sure we're out there. And I think I saw in the chat, someone mentioned this is the first they saw publicly that Verizon has done something around the topic. So. Just want to let you guys know that we are out there. We're making sure, as a, as the NAB leader, 
we're making sure that our causes are heard um, on the corporate level. So, Puli, back to you. Thank you, Malachi. And, you know, we could have gone so much longer in this discussion. There was so much that was shared and a lot that has resonated. I know not just with me, but with with the audience, with everybody that's been watching this today. Um, as we get, you know, we start to wrap this up and close today's discussion. I just wanted to remind everyone that the recording of today's discussion will be posted on the Tech Futures website. We hope you will look for the recording link and share it on your social media pages to help amplify uh, this phenomenal discussion and very important discussion that was taken today. We also wanted to thank Jordan and Lucy. Um, thank you. We cannot express our gratitude enough for bringing greater insight to this discussion and bringing a voice to this topic. Thank you both for your passionate advocacy on behalf of the missing and murdered indigenous women and girls movement. And finally, thank you to everybody for joining us today. I'd just like to close with Jordan's words. Let's be that ripple effect. Take care.